Hi, this is David Brannon. I'm a long-term disability benefits lawyer and owner of the law firm Resolute Legal. Today I'm going to talk to you about how you prepare a winning appeal once your benefits have been denied by a long-term disability benefits insurer. Now, again, we're going to focus on how to prepare what I call the winning appeal. It's easy if, for you to get this if I tell you about the normal appeal that people do. The normal appeal, which is rarely successful, is that upon getting the letter saying that you've been denied benefits, uh, there usually be some general reasons in there. And it just says a statement like, just submit any more, if you submit any more medical evidence within the next 30 days, we'll consider it as an appeal. Most people then just get going and, and freak out, get to their doctor, and their doctor writes another letter. They send that in, and that's the appeal. That type of appeal is very ineffective, very low chance of success, unless there's some medical point that's come up that has not been kind of canvassed by your doctor before. Now, I want to contrast that to what I call the winning appeal. The winning appeal means that you take a very strategic and comprehensive approach to the appeal. With my clients, I treat the appeal like it is already, like we're already in the court case. So it starts with once you get the appeal letter, we sit down and craft out a comprehensive strategy for how we're going to win this appeal. It all starts with the strategy and the game plan. Now, the strategy and game plan that I would recommend for your case is going to depend on three things. Oh, three things. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to take into account your disability it's going, or your illness. It's going to take into account your occupation, your specific occupation. And then finally, it's going to take into account the insurance company that we're dealing with. This is why it's critical that when you're working with a lawyer on an appeal or on your application, they have to understand these three factors. You need a lawyer who's familiar with your job, who is familiar with the your medical condition, and also who's familiar with the insurance company, ideally, that they've fought against or worked with that insurance company before. Because the strategy you craft will have to take all those factors into account. That's the value that a good lawyer will bring to you. Now, the first thing I do when I get, when the client comes to me with the letter, the first thing we do is that I write to the insurance company and get all of their information. How can you craft a proper strategy if you don't even know what you're up against? Most of my clients are shocked at some of the stuff that comes in once we get the insurance company's file. They've been talking to doctors you didn't know about, getting you know kind of a, opinions, behind the scenes opinions. There may be surveillance. You're seeing now that they're creeping you on Facebook. And anyway, it, it can be kind of shocking, but th at the end of the day, we need to know that information if we're going to put forward the best possible appeal. The other thing I do is get the insurance company, we have to pin them down on specific detailed reasons for why you were denied. Usually the letter you have, and if you have it, get it out and look at it. I guarantee it probably says something like, there's no objective signs of disability, or the, the objective signs of disability do not uh, match with the subjective reports, or the doctor's reports of disability don't match with something. It's all mumbo jumbo. We need them to get detailed, specific, what it is, what are these objective, lack of objective signs they're talking about. Only when we can get them to give detailed reasons can we then attack those reasons and counter them. And then we know how to build the case and it becomes part of the strategy to change their mind about your situation. Now, the other thing that we do is in addition to getting the documents from the doctor, I would also get records from your physician, other health professionals, possibly your work, possibly your tax returns, uh, depends on the situation. This is something people rarely do. Even in the first instance when doing, ideally you would have already gotten all this stuff and given it to them during your application, but we're past that now. If you haven't already done so, now is the time to bring all the information to bear. Often the information in your family doctor's file provides a context and a history that corrobor corroborates, hard word to say, corroborates what you're saying. The insurance company is not out there digging around for information that's going to make it harder for them to deny your case. It's up to you to bring to bear the information that's going to help you. It's something most people overlook. They just follow the direction of the insurance company. You don't want to do that. The next thing is, again, this is something I, I've never seen someone do without having a lawyer help them, 
is get your own testing done. Go see your own experts. This is often the key to winning the appeal, winning or winning the initial application or winning at court, quite frankly, is that you need to bring to bear your own experts to give information. There's a, there's a very famous disability lawyer in New York. He calls it turning the tables, changing the dynamic. The best way to do this is by getting your own testing done. Now it does cost money. That's why you work with a lawyer to work that out. But that is often the key to success. The types of things I'm talking about are functional assessments to document your disability, uh, neuropsychological testing to document any neuro, uh, cognitive impairment or memory impairment, and the third thing would be vocational experts to talk about specifically why your disability, your symptoms prevent you, doing your, prevent you from doing your specific job duties. That's the kind of thing that's lacking. This isn't something your doctor would ever recommend because that kind of stuff isn't needed for your medical care. But it's medical opinions and, uh, the, and expert opinions that are relevant to your disability claim. I had a case recently where the case was denied. There was no hope, you know, no hope in sight. And we did our own testing. It turned the tables. It changed the whole dynamic. And it leads me to my second point. Once we get this other testing done, we then give that back to your doctors who've probably already written a report. Well, now they have new information. It can better inform their opinions. That's what happened in the case I had recently. We had neuropsychological testing done. It led the doctor to now have more information and the doctor was able to give a firmer opinion in favor of disability because they had more information. Sometimes we put doctors in an impossible task of getting opinions on disability when they're only seeing you a few minutes, a few hours a month at best. I mean, I don't, a few hours is probably way too much, probably less, much less than that. So how can you expect doctors to give those kind of opinions? We, we have to make it easier for the doctor to rely on credible information to better inform their opinions. Now, the next thing that we would look at so once we have got our own expert information, we've given that to your doctors, we've worked with your doctors to allow them to give a better opinion, the next step would be to get a comprehensive uh, detailing of your story, okay? Usually what you've given them for your story consists of two things. They give you the form uh, that you filled out that has a little tiny spot where you write in details about your situation. No, no real space to put any kind of detail there. That's one thing. The other thing is the interview where they called you on the phone and in that interview, do you think they're asking you things that are going to be favorable to you? No, they're trolling around to get information that's going to help them. So what we need to do, again, change the dynamic. We need to get a detailed statement from you that sets out a story of your situation and paints the picture that we want, the reality of your situation. Usually we can do this in the form of just a statement signed by you, or if we want to up the ante, we can do it as a sworn statement, so it's sworn under oath, that has a lot of credibility with the insurance company, because now they know you're not lying, you're gonna to have to be stuck with this sworn statement, uh, or it's perjury, you know. So there's legal implications, but honestly doing a sworn statement, it can have a lot, it can have a good effect on the insurance company, because now they've got a lot more details. And especially at the appeal level, you're dealing with new, you're not dealing with the same people who've handled your case up till now. So as you can see, we're building new information to give to the appeal people so that they have a reason to go against what their friend down the hall had said or down the floor below them, because usually they work in the same building. Uh, the next thing would be getting statements from other people, including your family, your coworkers, um, your boss, people who would be witnesses at a trial, basically. It, oft, it can sometimes be effective to get those kinds of statements in there as long as they're done properly. I often see when I get a case later on, usually after people have done some appeals, they're further on in the process, I'll see a lot of letters written by family and things. Usually they're not effective. They're just trying to appeal to the emotions, not really detailing the kind of information that would have credibility to help approve the claim. It's more like a venting. That doesn't help. I often see the client, my client has written these kind of venting letters, doesn't help. It has to be well thought out, part of a strategy, the information you give. Okay, the next thing 
depending on your medical situation and your medical diagnosis, uh, pulling in research, new medical research, uh, medical literature can be very effective in some cases and it's very appropriate to do. We'd want to pull that stuff together. Now the final thing would be Sometimes at this phase I can be successful in digging out if they have any surveillance videos of you and it's good to know that and see that at this phase so I can address it in the appeal that we're sending to them. So as you can see, I've been talking about all these things. This is the planning and preparing to, for the appeal. Most people the appeal is you got 30 days, you, you call your doctor, you're scrambling around, your doctor sends a new letter in and that's the appeal. Well, my friend, that is destined for failure. Our appeal, as you can see, we go through a whole bunch of things where we gather all this information and it builds towards the grand finale, which is me or a lawyer at our practice putting together a detailed brief, which is simply a letter addressing all the issues, 20 to 30 pages long sometimes, plus all the attachments, detailing in, uh, how it is that you are disabled, why you can't do your job. We address all the points that they have raised of why they think you should not be get the benefits. We directly hit those head on. Um, the whole purpose of this is to create a different tone for your case, to let them know we're serious. I mean, when it, it's impressive for them to get in this type of document, because trust me, 99.99% of people are not sending in a comprehensive appeal like this, so it makes an impression. Put yourself in that adjuster's shoes. When you are faced with something like this that's well thought out, well put together, you're more likely to stamp approved on this one and just move on to the other cases that are not well put together and have holes in them. You're more likely to get approved when you take an aggressive but uh, comprehensive approach with the appeal. Now, if you want more information on uh, hiring me to do an appeal or what, what, how lawyers handle these appeals, please call the number below, book a time to set up a free phone consultation with me, again, free of charge, or fill out one of the forms on the website that ask also for the consultation. You'll get an email from us enabling you to book the, the call or you can just kind of reply back to me in the email. Uh, actually, the email you get will ask for some more information. You can give me that information, give me some more details. We can go back and forth a bit by email, but honestly, I can't give detailed, long opinions by email. You will have to get on the phone with me, as horrible as that can sometimes be. Uh, I know it's not easy to pick up the phone and call a lawyer. I'm not a bad guy to deal with. Uh, I'm very laid back. I'll be honest with you. And so sometimes the best thing for you to do is just, we can email a little bit, but at some point we have to get on the phone and I can lay it out for you. Again, there's no charge for that. It's no sales pitch. My goal is to try to help you be most effective as possible in terms of getting your appeal approved. Now, there was a time when I was pretty down and out on these appeals. Frankly, I used to recommend to people don't do them at all, just go straight to filing a lawsuit. I'm not that strong against the appeals as I used to be. I've softened up on this because I've seen some recent successes over the past uh, year uh, in certain circumstances. And again, that's often where there has not been a comprehensive job. So I haven't, usually it's where I haven't been involved in the application. So it's not been a comprehensive application. So we can now bring a lot of that to bear here. Because again, what you're asking, you're asking the insurance company you're asking their appeal department, because it goes to a different department. You're asking that appeals department to overturn their own, their own colleague down the hall or in the floor below. That's a very extraordinary thing to ask. You need to let them, you need to help them to help you. You help them by giving them a ton of information that wasn't available to the claims handler. So that now they have 101 reasons why they can approve your claim and save face with their claims handler saying, well, look, like oh, you didn't have all this stuff. The claims handler's like, oh yeah, right. If I had that, I would have approved it. It allows them to save face. You've given them reasons. It's really the only way you're gonna have success at this level of appeal. If you're not prepared to do this level of appeal, move on to the lawsuit phase, which is quite frankly handled very similar to this. And if you do this comprehensive appeal, it doesn't if they don't approve it, you now have such a base that you can move into your lawsuit and things can move much more quickly. Okay, that's all for now. Again, 
the number below, use the number below to call me, to book a time to speak with me, or fill out one of the forms on the, my website and I'll start an email dialogue with you. But at the end of the day, at some point, we'll have to talk by phone if you want a more detailed opinion from me or advice. Take care. Thank you.